Okay, welcome to the first podcast. This is on asexual reproduction in chromosomes. You should have printed off a lecture sheet from Moodle, and we'll fill in the blanks as we've done before in class. What's new is on the one side, there's something called side notes. And you can either look at the calendar on Moodle, or I've assigned it in class, written it on the board, and you'll add either video tutorials, additional information, or readings from the book. Anything that we did not cover in the lecture that would be additional information. So don't rewrite all of the same material again. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So what is asexual reproduction? It's making any offspring, and it only needs or requires one parent to do that. You don't need a male and a female to produce an offspring. Here are some different examples. The first example is budding, and that's where you're going to take the parent organism and it's going to generate a new organism. So when it's ready to reproduce, a small bud will form somewhere on the parent organism, and when it reaches maturity, it simply falls off and you've developed a new organism. So that's budding. Fragmentation is just like if you drop a plate or glass on the floor. It breaks into little pieces or fragments. Same thing happens here. You take a full-grown organism, it's going to break into individual pieces. Each piece will then grow into a new organism. So let's actually look at some examples. One for fragmentation would be Planera. And I have a diagram down here at the bottom. Planera is a flatworm. And so I could take this one parent flatworm and break it into three pieces. The head could become a full, mature flatworm. The tail could become a flatworm, and even the mid part, midsection, could become a flatworm. Other examples would be sea stars, fungi, and algae. For budding, some examples would be hydra. And again, I have a diagram. So I start here with the mature hydra, and you can see her on the side. It's got a little bud starting to grow and it will keep growing and developing. When it's mature, it will then fall off and be a full-grown hydra. Yeast also reproduces this way, and so does potatoes. If you ever left a potato in the refrigerator and you'll start having these little green spots growing in leaves, those are buds. So make sure that you can explain these examples and the difference between the two if we have a quiz in the near future. Okay, asexual reproduction in plants. When you have vegetative reproduction, it's going to make new individuals without the production of seeds or spores. So one or two good examples would be grass and strawberries. And what they do is they will send out little horizontal stems called runners. And sometimes you may hear them called also rhizomes or stolons if they run above or below ground. But here's an example of a strawberry plant. This is the parent plant. And all these little stems coming off of it on top of the ground are little runners and they will develop the fruit or the strawberries. Asexual reproduction in animals is when you have an unfertilized egg and it will develop into an individual and it will be genetically identical to the mother. So it will go through mitosis which we've covered earlier in another chapter. So insects and other animals can reproduce this way so we have our bees even lizards and fish, some of the higher organisms. Here's one specific example. The desert whiptail lizard is all females, and when they're ready to reproduce, um, the eggs become fertilized, and then they develop new organisms. So that actually has a more technical term called parthenogenesis, and it's when asexual reproduction will grow and develop the embryos without fertilization, so that is asexual reproduction. Okay, in eukaryotes, it's going to involve mitotic cell division. So the new organisms are going to grow from one parent, and they are always identical to the parent. And that's what makes asexual reproduction different from sexual reproduction. Now, there's always some exceptions, and it happens when there is a mutation. Usually when it goes through mitosis, the chromosomes will divide, and so for example, these will divide and you notice that it is genetically identical to the parent and supposed to, these are also, these cells down at the bottom are supposed to be gene genetically identical. But something called non-disjunction, which we'll cover later, basically that means those chromosomes do not divide or split equally. 
So you may have, this could be sperm and egg cells, for example, these four across the bottom. So you may have, if it's a human, you may have one cell that has 46 chromosomes, which would in turn be 23 if it was an egg or a sperm. And you may have another one that has 47, or it could be 24, 25. So they're not divided equally, so that's a mutation. Organisms that are genetically identical are called clones. Probably the most famous would be Dolly the sheep, okay? Basically, in a nutshell, I'm just going to simplify this. What they did is they took two different donors, two different sheep, and the one sheep, they did something called enucleation, which means they removed the nucleus from the cell. So it had no nucleus. They took a second donor, and they took the nucleus and implanted it into the cell that did not have one. There was a jolt of electricity, a current pulse, and that generated the starting of mitosis and cell division. When it finally reached the stage, so you notice now it's not in an organism, so it's done in a petri dish or a test tube. So once it reached the stage called a blastocyst, and again, we'll cover this later, but that is basically the cells have divided, it's a hollow ball, and it's right before the layers start specializing, becoming tissues and organs. Once it reaches this stage, it's then implanted into a surrogate, and then the surrogate will develop the young until maturity or until birth, and then that's Dolly. Okay, chromosome numbers. Each species has a set or a certain number of chromosomes. Now, if you have two or more species that have the same number, they're still going to be different, and it's all based on the number of genes and how they're arranged and how they're different. I pulled some examples. There's a lot more examples out there, and I just use the basic names. These are actually specific, like rat and monkeys, but I could take a species of rat, oats, like your cereal, and a particular kind of monkey, this is actually the Reese's monkey, each one of those has 42 chromosomes. Obviously, even though they have the same number of chromosomes, they are totally different organisms, and that's because of the genes. You could also have, for example, two beavers. One's an American and one's a European. They have the exact same genus, but they are different species. One, the American, has 40 chromosomes, and the European has 48. And then just to show the extremes and number of chromosomes, the most chromosomes that are found, that are known to date, of course there's a lot of species that have not been discovered, a particular fern has 1,260 chromosomes, and the fewest is this particular species of ant has only two. Now probably the most common one you've heard of, the fewest number would be eight, and that would be the fruit fly, because that's usually what scientists study when they're doing genetic tests. Okay, prokaryotes. So we focused on eukaryotes. Now let's look at prokaryotes. So they usually only have one set of chromosomes, and this would be an example of bacteria. You can see here this mass in the middle. It's actually called a nucleoid. You notice it does not have a membrane. Um, it also has something separate, which is the DNA. It's called a plasmid, and we don't need to worry about that for the test. But it does not have a membrane, and that's why when you get a cut, it can generate into an infection so quickly because they can replicate so quickly. Okay, eukaryotes. So we have chromosomes, and chromosomes always occur in pairs because you're going to match up a chromosome from your mom and a chromosome from your dad. Now there's always some exceptions, as always. So when we look at two chromosomes of a pair, they are called homologous chromosomes or homologs. Either term is sufficient. Think of it as a pair of shoes. So I went out to the internet and I grabbed some different pairs of shoes. So you notice they're pretty much heels, similar color, but they're all a little bit different. They're like the chromosomes, okay? The structure is the same, they have the same function, but they are homologous chromosomes. Now there are some chromosomes, the sex chromosomes, where you may have one black heel and one blue. So that would be the exception. So one may be a large chromosome and one be a small chromosome. And when we do genetic testing, we'll look at that a little closer. 
a tetrad, and we'll see this when we look at meiosis, and this is making of the sex cells, is called a tetrad. So when I have a pair of homologous chromosomes, so here are the pairs of homologous chromosomes, and we'll look at this particular phenomenon called crossing over. This allows for organisms to be genetically different from one another, that crossing over. Okay, chromosome numbers and how they are different. So we said that in asexual reproduction, the number of chromosomes are maintained, which means they are identical to the parent, and that occurs through mitosis. In sexual reproduction, you have a new individual. So you have two new nuclei, one from the mom and one from the dad. When you unite those two together, that is called a zygote. So make sure you know that. Here's an illustration, and it's kind of hard to tell. You don't know which one's the male and which one's the female. So one's the egg nuclei, one's the sperm nuclei. But once they come together, it is then called a zygote. Sexual reproduction. So there are reproductive cells, and those are collectively called gametes. Now we're going to see a term later on that's called gonads. Do not get that confused with gametes. The gametes is the sperm and the egg. Sperm for the male, egg for the female. The gonads, and we'll cover this later, are the structures that hold the gametes. Okay, so gametes containing only one chromosome from a homologous pair, so one shoe, that is called a haploid, single, a single shoe. And we use the symbol, a lowercase n. When I'm talking about the gametes of two chromosomes, a pair of shoes, two, that is diploid, di means two. And so the symbol for that is a two n. Okay, so if I was looking at humans, the haploid number, egg, would have 23 chromosomes, the sperm would have 23 chromosomes. All the cells in your body have a total of 46 chromosomes, not including the sex chromosomes. Okay. okay, here's some diagrams, and you can always pause it right here and look at it a little closer. I'm just going to run through this real quick and point out some things. Okay, let's start here at the top. I've got my haploid gametes, you notice N. 23, so 23 in the egg, 23 in the sperm. Once they unite through fertilization, it's going to make a zygote, so now I have 46. It will then start dividing, going through mitosis until it makes a complete individual, so that's the growing of the baby. And then when the adults need to make new sperm and egg cells, it will go through meiosis, cutting that number in half, making haploid cells. Now to the left, we have the process of meiosis, and I just threw it on here. We're going to see this again a little bit later. But here's the process of making sperm, and here is the process of making eggs. So we have oogenesis and spermatogenesis. And then over here on the right, you can see we have the sperm and the egg unite, make a zygote, it fertilizes the egg. Okay, when I have the union of two haploid nuclei, the egg and the sperm, it's going to restore the cell to the diploid number and make sure you can explain these two differences. So meiosis will produce a haploid or N cell, a reproductive cell, egg, sperm. Fertilization, the keyword is restores. So it's going to restore it to the diploid number. And again, I threw down this example, haploid 23 and 23, and I have a diploid of 46. And so that concludes our podcast. So we spent about, oh, 14, 15 minutes. So again, you can look at this several times, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks.